Seth, we're both enjoying this FQXI conference on physics of the observer, physics of events, trying to understand what events are and observers are and this very theoretical stuff. And uh, of the, I don't know, 125 people here, uh, I've been counting on my hands the people who, who actually are involved in some kind of experiments. I mean, who are actually involved in the real world and getting data about, about quantum mechanics. And you're certainly one. So I, I, I want to ask you in, in terms of the, the, all the theory and ideas that we're hearing, hearing w w what kind of experiments where we're getting real data in quantum mechanics using quantum mechanical theory at a fundamental level, not the applications and you know, all kinds of electronics, but at a fundamental level, what's being done? Uh, yeah, well, first of all, Robert, I, I'm, I'm a theorist, but I do work closely with experimentalists, and I spend a lot of time analyzing data. It's like a detective story, by the way. It's like, how can this data possibly be the case? Yeah. You know, what's going on? And then yeah. it's like Sherlock Holmes, you know, once you've eliminated the possible, <laughs> then the only the thing left is the impossible. Yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, we wouldn't have quantum mechanics if it weren't for experiment. You know, if it were up to the theorists like Einstein, who hated quantum yeah, mechanics, sure. but then for to heck with it, we wouldn't have it. Quantum, we have quantum mechanics because people couldn't explain things like black body radiation, the behavior of heat. They couldn't explain the spectrum uh, of emission of light or an absorption of light by atoms and molecules. Um, they couldn't explain the behavior of elementary particles or electrons. You need quantum mechanics to explain the experiments. Um, one of the interesting things about current experiment in quantum mechanics is whereas, you know, 100 years ago, we just had a few experiments, things like spectral experiments, looking at hydrogen atoms and electrons. Now we just have vast quantities of experiment um, pushing the quantum mechanical realm into places that it's never been before to a very macroscopic level. You have big, huge things being quantum mechanical. You, know, you can have a superfluid in a cavity that's this big, and you can that's look at the quantum mechanical huge. motion of that. Or you can even have a two-ton weight suspended by a wire, and you can see the zero-point fluctuations, these quantum mechanical effects, and the jiggling of this weight. How, how could that happen? How, how do you get the such scale differences between a two-ton weight and the minuscule quantum uh, fluctuations? Well, there's over the course of the last hundred years, the, uh, there's been a tremendous increase in the precision of experiments and control. So the, the accuracy of measurement and the accuracy of controlling things has gone up by many, many orders of magnitude. We're millions or billions of folds more accurate in measuring things mm. like time, for instance, mm, yeah. than we were um, 50 years ago. Mm. So um, <clears throat> what, perhaps one of the most precise experiments in, uh, on the planet is, the, uh, is LIGO, the Gravitational Observatory. This is a quantum mechanical interferometer that uses um, uh, effects between interfer interference between light, which is itself quantum mechanical. On two axes. On two axes, it's kilometers long and on each two, axis. And there are two of them thousands of miles apart to uh, eliminate uh, trucks uh, traveling or local ground perturbations. Right, and so, and, and indeed, you can even measure the time difference, you know, in terms of if a gravitational wave comes in, it's gonna hit one of them first and another yeah. one second. To, you know, it's, it's like kilometers long here, and then it's also, um, it's, you know, there's thousands of kilometers between them, and it's measuring distances that, you know, are 10 to the minus 28 centimeters or something it's like that. It's unbelievable, it's one ten thousandth, I've heard, one ten thousandth the diameter of a proton. Yeah, I, I mean that, that 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 sounds just impossible. Well, you know, when there are trucks uh, going on roads nearby and having local vibrations, people breathing. <laughs> but they, hey, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm really impressed. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. It's really it's a remarkable feat. Okay. And as a result of having these um, these uh, much better precision in terms of 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 measuring things out, then all kinds of things where you had never been able to detect their quantum mechanical nature before, now you can oh, do okay, that. Okay. So that's really the kind of the signature feature of the current world in quantum mechanics is that we're finding quantum mechanical effects and phenomena in places where we would never have expected mm. to find them before. Yeah, g give me just some sense of the uh, s uh, structure of the field of, uh, of fundamental uh, experiments in quantum mechanics. I mean, what are the general, some general categories of experiments that are being done? Well, of course, you know, there's the traditional ones like the Large Hadron Collider, where you're looking at quantum mechanical effects in sure, elementary okay. particles, okay. which is uh, a time-honored tradition. Sure. Um, there are uh, 
very practical kinds of applications like in atomic clocks. You know, th these are the world's most precise measurement apparatuses where you can uh, uh, tick out time at frequencies of of a million billion times a second. Um, uh, and these operate in a purely quantum mechanical fashion. Dave Wineland's quantum logic quantum clock uh, measures optical frequencies and ticks out times at optical frequencies by entangling the optical frequency of, of a, an atom with its microwave frequencies. Um, uh, so there are precision measurement um, uh, applications of quantum mechanics at large scale, like LIGO, as we were just saying. Then there's a, a, a very interesting set of um, uh, uh, quantum mechanical experiments that involve quantum complexity of um, making more and more and more complex quantum systems. Actually, probably the, the sort of the most um, fundamental and pure version of this is the uh, attempt to build quantum computers, which is what I've been involved with for right. the last two and a half decades. Um, uh, of trying to make you know the individual quantum bits or qubits in the computers more precise, but then adding more and more and more of these qubits and so that you can get hundreds or thousands of entangled qubits and then try to get them to uh, see if you can convince them to perform complicated quantum computations. So where are we in that? That's uh, the, the, the real promise and so maybe exaggerated in terms of quantum com computing. Where, where are we? How, how many bits uh, quantum bits, qubits, uh, can be dealt with in terms of I keeping them isolated from the rest of the world so they don't de decohere, which seems very difficult to do when you have multiple. And, and how powerful is that system when, when you have hundreds or thousands? Uh, that's incredible because, you know, it used to be only two or three, eight would be, it was remarkable. Yeah, well, so, so in fact, well, first of all, I think we've been better in our quantum information community, we're not we're like nuclear fusion, we're promising it's always 10 <laughs> years away. We started out saying this is gonna be very difficult. Uh. It is very difficult, we've admitted it all along. Yeah, we started out the very first experiments, which I was involved in actually using nuclear magnetic resonance. Um, uh, 1996, 1997, we had just two qubits. And actually with two qubits, you and can still do interesting computations. I'm like, very proud to have done it. <laughs> yeah, we're proud to have done it as well. And then we expanded to, you know, to five or six qubits. And then ion traps are a very powerful technology for this. And also Bose-Einstein condensates, um, where you have, a, um, where you have a, atoms that are trapped, for instance, in optical lattices. Um, these are also very powerful systems for doing quantum information processing. So what's happened over the last couple of decades is the the number of quantum bits, be they atoms, be they um, ions, be they nuclear spins, or now very excitingly with superconducting systems, um, the number that we can put together has been growing and also the precision with which they can be controlled is increasing. So in fact, the last, um, the last five, five to 10 years have seen a tremendous increase in the quantum coherence of superconducting systems. These are, by the way, are completely wacky systems. I was also involved in the first experiments to build this particular kind of superconducting system where you have a little superconducting ring and supercurrent going around in a clockwise fashion is zero and supercurrent going around in a counterclockwise fashion is one and the supercurrent going clockwise and counterclockwise at the same time is zero yeah. and one at the same time. Right. And it's hard to imagine that, but right. that's what's happening. So um, these particular kinds of systems, these superconducting qubits, have gotten a million times better in terms of wow. their quantum characteristics. <laughs> they can be controlled to, you know, to uh, uh, four nines worth of accuracy. Mm. Moreover, <laughs> people have showed that you can build large scale quantum integrated circuits where you can put together thousands of these superconducting qubits on the same circuit. Now, if you can put a thousand superconducting qubits on the same circuit, and you can couple them and control them to this very high degree of accuracy, then you could have a quantum computer that has a thousand qubits. You could perform thousands of operations. We're not there yet, but I think we're very likely to be there in the next five to 10 years. Simulate if you have a quantum computer that has a thousand qubits that can be all, um, uh, uh, super, have a superposition of all of them together because it's not additive, it's exponential. Yeah, so some of the problems, the, the promise of quantum computing um, is that uh, by having all of these things in some funky entangled state that's doing a gajillion things at once, that there are certain kinds of problems that you can solve exponentially faster than a classical computer. And in fact, some, some problems in factoring uh, and, and, and cryptography, 
it, with a classical computer, no matter how big, you would take the the, the history of the universe to to work, and, and and it can be solved in 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 uh, in real time with a quantum computer in 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 hours or minutes. Yeah, that's right. And one of the really interesting developments now is that. Um, there are a bunch of special purpose kinds of devices that exhibit quantum complexity. So there are quantum annealers uh, uh, where you, you uh, are trying to construct a, say, a superconducting quantum circuit that in its ground state exhibits large scale entanglement and might be able to help solve hard problems. Um, or, and there, now you have optical systems, so optics on a chip where you have hundreds or thousands of optical interferometers that are just on a silicon chip, and then you can control how the photons are moving through these circuits. And people have done experiments that exhibit funky statistics that you couldn't possibly get classically. So go uh, 25, 30 years in the future, what do you see in quantum computing? So I think it's quite likely, well, I mean, you know, 25, 30 years in the computer, you know, in the future, now you're asking me to predict things that I, I have no idea what's going to happen. So, so I, I'm not going to take that big, but, but I think that, you know, I, 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 let me, let's talk just in, in the near term. I think in the next five to 10 years, um, even in five years, we're going to have, um, say, superconducting quantum computers with 50 or 100 qubits on them, maybe up to 1,000, where you could do things you could never do on a classical computer. And at the same time as, as uh, you're, uh, that you are, uh, uh, have these new devices, there are new algorithms you can do like machine learning, quantum machine learning, um, precision measurement, which is going to make it a very exciting time for the future of quantum computing.